All right, hi everybody, and welcome back to another edition of Beyond the Cage. I am your host, Jim Graham. Alongside me is my co-host, The Juice, Dave Sadler. We have a special guest joining us here on the show. He will be fighting June 6 down in Louisiana in the welterweight <laughs> division. He is Mr. Brian Ebersall, and Brian, thanks for coming back on the show. No problem, but special is not the adjective I would prefer to, you know, label myself with, but that's all right. We'll work on that later. We'll try to come up with some more. All right. The last time we talked to you, Brian, was all the way back in September, right after your win over John Howard. So, of course, in that uh, span of time, we had quite a few holidays, Halloween, Christmas, New Year's. So I guess in uh, a couple of uh, brief sentences, how was your uh, holiday season? Beer and burgers. <laughs> and a beach. That was a short, that was a short, that was a short sentence. <laughs> yeah. Beer, burgers, and beach. That, that's what I was up to. I was down in Florida and, um, yeah, bought a house with my, uh, my fight purse. It was a small one, ugly one. Got to fix it up a fair bit. And, um, yeah, trying to get settled in in, uh, in a new state, in a new country. I've, I've lived overseas for like eight years now, so it's, uh, it's interesting being back here. So whereabouts in Florida? Uh, Pensacola, which is like southern Alabama. Ooh, the nice. panhandle. Well, it's you like, could practice. They did steal, like, that part of the, the coast from Alabama. Like, by all rights, that should be Alabama. <laughs> they, uh, that's awfully close to Louisiana. You could practically ride a bike there. I think I'm going to ride a bike back. Oh, huh. well, fair. Yeah, yeah you, don't, you don't want to get too tired on your way there. So, yeah, that makes, that makes tons oh, of no, sense. Oh, no, no, a motorcycle. I'll be on the back. My wife will be driving it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can see Brian. I can see you and your wife. Uh, it, it would remind me of like that scene in Dumb and Dumber where they're on like the little moped going like, like seven miles an hour. That, so, that would be you guys. So I am your special <laughs> guest today, huh? Yeah. <laughs> you guys are really hammering that point home. I believe oh, that's a, uh, it's a straight shot on Route Ten. Yeah. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, take that. Actually, out. yeah, yeah, it is. That's my knowledge right there coming through. All right. Uh, was now, Dave of course, looking for the juice? I think so. Here. Right here? Yeah. That was, uh, I think Vitor Belfort stopped by and left that for Dave. So, <laughs> Kidding, kidding, kidding. I have him winning tonight. I have him winning tonight. Just in case people forgot, go to the picks on Beyond the Cage Facebook page and see that, uh, yes, I did pick him winning. So. I could make that joke. All right. Now, <laughs> now of course, uh, you said you obviously, as fans know, you lived overseas uh, for the last few years over in Thailand, and obviously you're from America, but moving back, you, that now that you've uh, been gone so long, what's, like, the biggest difference? Obviously, the, the you picked a place that has kind of a similar climate, uh, Florida to Thailand tropical. You're not moving back here uh, to Illinois where there's snow uh, and a lot of cold and changing a season. So climate-wise, probably the same to you, but in terms of, uh, you know, just living, what have you had to kind of adjust back to? Driving a car again and uh, the food. Um, they don't know anything but organic over there. I don't think they spray poisons on all of their food. Um, and then, obviously, again, the traffic and, and things, it's, it's, uh, it's busier over there but a lot different when you're on a scooter and, and you can weave your way through traffic if you need to. Um, so, yeah, just probably those two things, like getting back into a car every single day has been a bit different. Now, from a training aspect, obviously you're right there at Tiger Muay Thai, obviously now different. How has it affected your training for uh, heading into this fight camp? Well, in Thailand, when I worked at Tiger, it was pretty simple. I mean, the camp's open air. I could go in there at 11 at night and hit a bag. Um, I have the key to the wrestling room, so I can go in there anytime and, and do my work. Uh, whereas now, I, I don't have the same scenario. Um, you know, I'm in Chicago. I'm driving out to one of the suburbs uh, to train with Izzy Style Wrestling and Valley Flow Striking out of Addison, um, and they've got some you know some great athletes, some great coaches. But again, it's it's a 40 minute round trip, and that's if traffic treats me well. And um, yeah, it just changes the whole course of a day, not being able to step right outside your door and, and be right there. That's my dog with a dynamite drop-in in the background, <laughs> keeping it real. Now, of course, uh, for this fight camp, you had to kind of change gears a little bit. You were originally supposed to fight kind of the hometown guy there in Alan Joe Boy. Now it has been changed. Let me see if I can get his uh, name correct. I'll probably say it wrong. Omari Akhmedov is now your opponent <laughs> down Akhmedov. in Louisiana. And has that change affected your preparation at all for the fight? 
Um, I mean, physically, not really. I'm, I'm still, you know, doing what I'm doing uh, with my offense and my defense. Um, and my, you know, my game plan changes a little bit, but it's it's more uh, changing like slight small reactions. Um, Joe Ban, I think, did more things. I don't know if he did a better, but you know, he he had a more well-rounded game. He's obviously very happy on his back with a rubber guard and, and being an Eddie Bravo guy. Where Omari is a Russian wrestler, he wants to be on top. Um, when he's on bottom, he just tries to either hold you close or push away and stand up. So. Not much uh, drilling as far as you know, crazy submission attempts coming from the bottom um, for my opponent. And uh, the takedown game is going to be a lot different now. Where Alan, I thought I had an advantage over. Um, if we did get you know into a wrestle, Omari is going to have some reactions and stuff from his lifetime of, of playing that sport. So yeah, there's definitely a few differences. But in the end, I mean, I still got to show up happy and healthy and and uh, execute my basics and fundamentals. Now, I think I could be wrong, and you can correct me if I am. Part of the appeal probably fighting Joe Boy was kind of being the villain maybe a little bit, you know, kind of maybe ruin the hometown crowd's night. Now you don't have that kind of appeal going in. Does that change your focus at all or, or your drive at all, or is it just this is another fight and this is what I have to do? Um, I mean, it's always another fight, and it's always what I have to do is, is go disrupt someone's you know, rhythm and, and game plan. Um, I, I think fight week would have been a little bit more fun with Alan, just due to the fact that he speaks English and he's a male model and, and things like that. That would have been a bit fun. Um, so yeah, we could have had a bit more banter, where Omari obviously doesn't uh, speak English as a first language, and and uh, I'm not sure how much banter we're going to really have back and forth. You know what I just realized? A fight between Alan Jobuen and Sexyama would just break the UFC. <laughs> Am I right or no? Possibly. It's a good poster no, fight. No, I'm not. It's a good fight on <laughs> <Yeah>. poster. <laughs> All right. Sorry. No, ahead, continue. Jim. Continue. No, continue. I was. I know you had some more uh, more questions no, other than you know, uh, sexy Yama. So there's a lot of talk about all this stuff with, you know, Reebok deal. Whether it's good, it's bad. I don't even want to get into it. Fights are on. We're gonna go and watch those later, but. Here's what I want to know. When you started fighting way back when, did you ever, could you even possibly think that all these talks, all this stuff that's going on now, did you think any of that was even remotely possible when you started out? When I started out, I didn't think me being where I'm at right now it was you know, all that possible um, in the sense that the UFC athletes were getting 2-2 two and two back then or 1,500 and 1,500. Um, you know, they were fighting in random Duluth, Georgia venues, being blacked out of, you know, pay-per-view for a long period of time, um, just as I was really getting into the sport. So, yeah, I didn't really look at this as a career option. Um, I think I was just chasing sport uh, because that's what I've done my whole life and I didn't know what else to do. And um, working a menial job uh, full-time didn't appeal to me. Working a menial job... 80% full-time and, and spending the other 20% training and trying to travel to fight at least kind of leveled me out, you know, so that's kind of what I was doing. I knew I could get to the UFC eventually, um, but I didn't know the UFC was going to get this big. Uh, I'm glad it did, but yeah, there's been a lot of problems that have uh, that have come with it, obviously, as, as far as the power struggle between company and athlete. Yeah. Um, oh, go ahead, Dave. No, one other one other question. I know that the journey to get where you at was long, and uh, it's probably. <laughs> I mean, it's it's been publicized. Anybody who watches the show knows because we bring it up all the time. But uh, with all these different avenues to get to the UFC now, you know, the Ultimate Fighter. You know, there's amateurs now. There's amateurs. There's low level amateurs, high amateurs. You know, low level pros. There's all these different ways to get there. Would you change it at all for the way that you got there? Or no, was the... I had I had an absolute blast traveling and, and, and doing what I did, and uh, it it was like mysterious back then. There was a mystique to it. You never knew if you were going to fight a guy at your roundabout weight. You never knew if you were going to fight a guy, you know, short, tall, fat, ripped. Uh, you know, you never knew what style he was going to be. Most of the fights I had in my first twenty five fights, um, outside of a couple notable guys were people I had no clue who they were, how they fought, how they stood, orthodox southpaw, didn't matter. 
Um, and again, you don't know a thing about their skill set unless you can go, you know, look them up on the internet because they'd wrestled or done some Golden Glove boxing at that stage. I mean, there were no uh, internet records for karate and taekwondo tournament champions back then. So it was, um, yeah, I, I quite enjoyed it. You know, traveling to Mexico, not knowing if I was going to get paid, not knowing if I was going to make it back across the border, things like that. It was, it was different. Yeah, so yeah. I enjoyed it. Hey. <laughs> hey Jim, think about it like this: When Brian started fighting, to go online, you had to use Netscape Communicator or whatever. <laughs> Wasn't it called that back then? <laughs> or Netscape yeah. Navigator? Isn't that what it was called? Yep. Yeah. yeah, that was one of them. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, one thing I did want to uh, kind of—it's kind of piggybacking off the Reebok deal. I saw an article earlier today. Um, he's obviously fighting here at UFC 187, Joseph Benavidez. In wake of the Reebok deal, he has decided to let go of his management company and his manager, and saying that well, now with Reebok sponsors, obviously are going to change. They're going to be different. You know, I'm not going to need them as often. So I think I can do that myself uh, moving forward after having his same manager for about seven years. Is that something at all that you have considered, just trying to kind of do stuff like that on your own? Or... Even, when I, even when I had a manager, uh, I didn't consider it having a manager. I considered it uh, more of a friendly uh, relationship. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I went out to California on a management contract that said if I made over $1,500 a fight, then I had to pay a percentage. And if I didn't, I didn't have to pay a percentage. Um, and when I left that gym and went with Frank Shamrock, uh, it was basically a verbal agreement. There was, you know, a contract, but um, wasn't anything major there. And to be fair, at both gyms, AK and, and Frank's gym, I was the one finding fights for myself and my teammates. So I felt like I was part of the management team, even though I wasn't being compensated as such. Um, so moving forward, getting into the UFC... Uh, a promoter in Australia and a good friend of mine, Justin Lawrence, actually got the email back from Joe Silva. Had that email not went to Justin, I'm not sure Justin would have got a percentage of my fight purses. If that email came back to me, I would have been self-managed. Now, I'd have reached out to Justin or someone else to chase sponsors because um, I'd rather train and, and not really do that, though I'm right. capable, you know, and I've, I've written a few emails that have went to sponsors. Um but they've come from other people's email addresses at times as well. Um, in this day and age, I, I don't really find it that hard to manage yourself, especially within the UFC. Um, putting out, you know, again, a tender and, and telling someone they can have 20% or whatever the percent is to chase sponsors for you, I, I still don't consider that someone managing you, you know. I, I think a manager is someone that actually sets your training, uh, puts you in places, sets your travel, you know, helps you establish uh, uh, relationships with good coaches, good gyms, uh, and fight promotions, let alone sponsors. And that's something I've, I've really done for myself anyway. So to see, you know, Bienvenidos come out and do an interview like that, I think a lot of guys are probably going to follow suit because there's not much negotiation that goes into, uh, you know, UFC contracts unless you're special. And um, some of the guys that are special don't realize it, so they don't really even negotiate. You know, you get a, once in a blue moon, you get a Conor McGregor or a Ronda Rousey that says, hey, I've had my three fights, uh, I'm going on my last fight, and you guys want to resign me to another four-fight deal, but we're really going to have to talk about this money. Most of the time, they don't take you seriously when you say that, um, but every now and again, you, you might really get to go sit down with Dana and Lorenzo and actually have that chat. But, um, yeah, the, the way of the manager, I think, is going to change greatly. Within MMA, there might be guys that uh, they'd be more like matchmakers now that can help you manage your career and get you good training and good fights. Um, but yeah, the sponsorship thing, unless uh, unless you've got some camera presence and some ability to bring customers to a local business, I don't really see how this endorsement thing's gonna gonna really play out. You know, the UFC still holds uh, our brand in their hands as much as as much as they like to tell us. You know. On, on paper or through interviews that we're our own brand and you know we're responsible for doing this and doing that and we have a, a, a limited window to make the most out of our opportunity well they are our opportunity and then putting us on TV is what makes that opportunity valuable so right. now just one a, more uh, thing uh, I just want to get one more thing piggybacking off the sponsors Dave and I uh, we did a 
couple minutes on an article where Scott Coker was interviewed saying that his phone, since this uh, Reebok payout has been announced, has been ringing off the hook, not only with sponsors but fighters looking to him. And he's kind of downplayed a little bit saying, if you're a free agent, we can sign you. If you're not, we can't do anything. And it seems like this sponsorship thing has uh, upset some fighters, and some may be looking to go to Bellator coming up. Uh, Brian, it seems like you're you're happy where you're at here with the UFC, but do you foresee here maybe in the next couple months or when uh, guys and gals are free agents, do you see Bellator possibly getting uh, some good talent here just because of this Reebok thing? Well, here's the issue. How many UFC guys have you ever seen become free agents? We saw Roy Nelson fight out his contract. Dana was going to let him do that because Dana doesn't like Roy Nelson all that much. And we saw Phil Davis take the risk of winning or losing his last fight to finish out his contract. And um, the UFC didn't bother matching what I thought was a subpar deal for him to go to Bellator um, because they don't like his fighting style and they realize that he'll always be a perennial top ten but he'll never be a champion. So they were happy to let him go. Um, every time I've got to the last fight of my deal, they send me a new contract. So it basically outlines my pay and, and I feel like I'm on a, a never-ending contract. Now, some of these guys reaching out to Bellator... I think are doing it in the sense that they want to gauge what money they could get from Bellator and they want to make sure it's a risk reward worth taking because if if I have one fight left on my deal and they send me that new contract and I say uh, I want to negotiate and they say well there's no negotiating this is what we think you're worth and you say well I want to fight out my deal and be a free agent your deal has a certain number of fights and a date on that uh, contract that you have to have your last fight in by. Now, if you refuse fights and turn down fights because you're injured, they can extend the date on the contract. So I've actually done that a couple times because I've had like nine months between fights more than once. So they've actually sent me a, an addendum to my contract that puts more time on the contract. Same number of fights. Long story short, getting to be a free agent from the USC, it's, it's pretty hard. The guys like Roger Huerta, who said they wanted to negotiate and things like that on their last deal, Roger got sat out for like a year and a half without being given a fight. Now, why'd they do that? Well, because he wanted to leave, so they made it as hard as possible for him to leave by giving him a fight one month before his contract's due date was going to end. So that way they didn't breach the contract, but they didn't exactly treat him nice. Yeah. So and a lot of these guys, to become a free agent... They've got to sit out that last year or more if the UFC wants to screw them around. They'll take that fight that UFC gives them, which is probably going to be a bad matchup for them. So then they might lose you know, that fight, leave the UFC on a loss, have low bargaining power with the UFC with a right-to-match option. And again, because it's paperwork, and you know that you know paperwork through the court system or, or you know this system here can take forever, you can get hung up for another six months, one year, without being able to fight for Bellator, even though they put an offer on your table and they're ready to sign you. So how many guys are willing to take two years off to be a free agent and then go sign with Bellator for less money on the off chance that they can get some sponsorship dollars? Yeah, and if you don't fight for two years, your name's not out in the MMA community, and they're like, who's, who's Brian Eversaw? He hasn't fought since 2010, you know, if, so, if that kind of thing happens. You're so not... Nice. Uh, now you see the whole point of us not really being our own powerful brand. Right. Even though they tell us that we have a small window to make the most of it, they yeah. don't always care to help us do that. And that's the sport yeah. in general. That's not just the UFC. I mean, World Series of Fighting and Bellator are probably very much the same way in their business practices, and the contracts look like they're all written the same. I mean, you can just look at the Eddie Alvarez situation to see that. They could have sat him out longer. I mean, Eddie yeah. actually got lucky. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, you know, the Rampage Jackson. Yeah, still Just going on. That. I cannot believe the terms of the contract that was released on SureDog and MMA.TV where he got a $125,000 Tesla 3 and this signing bonus and 250000 to shoot a commercial. I mean, that's insane. Yeah, and that's <laughs> why the, the legalities of his contract are so crazy because he was signed, like, to an entertainment contract, not necessarily a... Uh, exclusive Bellator fight contract, and any time right. you have more than just fights involved, that colludes things, and uh, yeah. that, that makes things uh, even more 
difficult to navigate. But um, I want to get back to your fight here uh, against Omari. And one thing I noticed, and I'm sure you noticed it when, when you were, uh, you know, agreed to to take him on. 14 and two is his record. Both of his career losses are by submission. Uh, they happen to be by guillotine choke. Most recently to Gunnar Nelson bar back in March of last year. Mentioned obviously a wrestler. That's his strong suit. That's what he likes to do. Is that something obviously you're you're very mindful of that this guy can get caught in submissions and that's something that maybe you would work more against this guy as opposed to someone else just because of his propensity to look like he can get submitted? I mean, nothing changes for me in the fact that I still want to be on top. Uh, I'm still a wrestler at heart, so I don't know if I can do the whole jumping guillotine and, and pulling him on top of me like Gunnar Nelson did. That said, it was probably an easier decision, you know, even if Gunnar wasn't a submission guy. He went for that guillotine after being in mount for about three minutes and landed some heavy strikes. So, um, you know, Omari probably wasn't going to get off any sort of wicked ground and pound and work by the end of the first round if he missed uh, – if he missed that attempt. And, and Gunner's a world champion, so off of his back he's comfortable. Um, so, no, I, I haven't looked at it and, and thought, oh, I'm going to go you know, sneak a sneaky triangle in there or anything like that. Um, I, I'm probably going to have to hit him or beat him really, really badly to a position to have a good chance at a submission. All right, yeah. Dave, what do you got for him? John Dodson is about to walk into the octagon. We should totally wrap this up. We should so totally we wrap this up. No problem, no problem. Did you have any other <laughs> questions you wanted to throw in there? No. Uh, I'll, I'll, be in, uh, I'll be in New Orleans, the Smoothie King Center. I want to see what a Smoothie King looks like. If he's not there, if the Smoothie King is not there, I'm going to be very upset. Maybe I can get Smoothie King to pay to walk out with me like Burger King paid to walk out with Pacquiao. Hey, Jim, I think I just broke the Internet. Here's me... On camera, looking at Brian <laughs> on the camera. I don't think that's allowed. <laughs> All right, I'll get I'll get you out of here with this, Brian. Obviously, the main event of your fight down there in New Orleans, Dan Henderson against Tim Bosch. Uh, what do you think about the fight, and who do you think is going to win? Uh, Dan. Tim Bosch is a tough dude, but and he wrestled. You know what I mean? I just think Dan's uh, a better clinch fighter, and. Um, yeah, I, I just don't see Tim Boach putting him on his back uh, and giving him a hard time. And, and Dan's good enough at, at the striking game to keep from getting knocked out. So I think it will come down to the clinch battle, and, and I think Dan's, uh, Dan's got the upper hand there. All right, he is Brian Ebersol. He will be fighting Omari Akhmedov June 6th down in New Orleans for UFC Fight Night. New Orleans will be shown on Fox Sports 1 coming up. And, Brian, thanks again for coming on the show. Wish you the best of luck, and I know Dave will be down there, and uh, I'll be watching on TV uh, cheering you on. Sweet, sweet. See you, Jim. All thanks. Right. All right, see you. For Dave Sadler, I am Jim Graham, and thanks for listening to another edition of Beyond the Cage. Hi,